So good evening, everyone. Um, I think most of you know me. I recognize most of you on the call, but I'm Keith Crumwitty, Dean of the Architecture Division here at California College of the Arts. Thanks for joining us tonight for this lecture by Georgina Hewlett, Ship Patterns. This is the fourth event of our Spring 2022 Architecture Lecture Series. If you'd like, you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your Zoom window with the live transcript button. At CCA, we understand land acknowledgement as a transformative act meant to confront our place on native lands and build mindfulness of our present participation in colonial legacies. California College of the Arts campuses are located in Weichin and Yalamu, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively, on the unceded territories of Chichenyo and Ramatu Shaloni peoples, who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous peoples in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples past, present, and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay respects to local elders, including those of the lands from which you're joining us virtually today. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to tell you about the next event in our series, Uncommoning Architectural Language next Thursday, March 10th. This event will bring together four speakers to explore ways in which cultural movements like Afrofuturism and Afro-surrealism can reveal new languages of spatial imagination to tackle questions of representation, appropriation, intersectionality, and authenticity within an aesthetics of spatial injustice. You can find the full spring lecture schedule along with stories by and about our students, faculty, and alumni at scaffold.architecture.cca.edu. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome Georgina Hewlich, partner with Marcelo Spina of Patterns, an architectural practice based in Los Angeles, to CCA. An architect and educator, Georgina holds a professional degree from the National University of Rosario, Argentina, and a Master of Architecture from UCLA, where she graduated with distinction. Since 2006, Georgina has been on the faculty at UCLA, where she's currently an adjunct associate professor. She's also taught at Yale, Penn, Syracuse, UC Berkeley, USC, and the Tokyo Institute of Technology. The work of Patterns has been published and exhibited widely, most notably at the Venice Biennale in Italy, Chicago Biennial, the Art Institute of Chicago, San Francisco MoMA, and the Mac Museum in Vienna. Most recently, Georgina and Marcello published the book Mute Icons and Other Dichotomies of the Real in Architecture, about which she will be speaking tonight. Described as part history, part theory, and part monographic atlas, Mute Icons interrogates historical, contemporary, and most importantly, speculative images, aiming to construct a viable alternative to the icon as a cliched and exhausted form of communication. Most directly, the book argues that architecture, far from being a crowd pleaser, can persist and function within society as a constructive cultural and social irritant. I'm particularly excited to have Georgina with us tonight, as I've known I think now, Georgina, what is it, 20 years ago or so? Yeah, um, I think Georgina so. Georgina came to Texas as part of a group of UCLA uh, graduate students who were participating in a six school, um, uh, how would we best describe it? Uh, a kind of a roving yeah. workshop. Yeah. Some um, kind of. Where we had three American schools, Rice, UCLA, and Princeton, and then three European schools, um, the Bartlett, Georgina, right? Um, I was at the AA, the AA the Technical Madrid. Institute in, in Barcelona, yeah. and the, um, I don't remember the name of the school in Paris. Oh, right. Was it? Yeah. And it was full of like amazing, I was on the faculty at Rice, Georgina was studying at UCLA. Um, the faculty traveled, the students traveled for intensive one week workshops. And since then, I've been really excited to watch Georgina's uh, career develop, the work with patterns uh, grow and take shape, uh, the attitude um, uh, grow richer uh, and sharper in that time, and also uh, have had the opportunity to visit UCLA for reviews and to see the work that Georgina is doing as an educator, which is really exciting. Um, I think the last thing I saw was the, your students were looking at the buildings on the UCLA campus and drawing the hell out of them, mm -hmm. if I correctly. Yes. Um, so I'm particularly excited tonight to hear Georgina present the work of the new book. So please join me in welcoming her virtually to CCA. Well, thank you, Keith. That was a very generous um, introduction. And um, yeah, thank you everybody for having me here. I'm super excited. And um, so, yeah, I guess next time I'm looking forward to being there or to receiving everybody here. 
So I think we are we are seeing that light at the end of the tunnel. I I I'm optimistic about it. So um okay, so shall I share the screen, Sarah? How yeah. do you want to do it? Yeah, sure. go ahead and share the screen. Okay, so um Looks great. Looks great. Looks good. Yeah. Yes. My name is well spelled. Like everything is in there. Okay. Good. Uh, <laughs> so um, okay. Well, again, thank you everybody for for having me. It's really it's a, a real pleasure um, to be presenting. Um, yeah, to be presenting the book. Uh, of course, I mean, the, this is, um, you know, when, I, when I talk about we, it's not just me, it's also my partner, Marcelo Espina, as Keith uh, mentioned, but also all the people that um, has been working with us for a long time. This is, I mean, as you may all know, a book is, um, I mean, a, a book takes time. It is, um, this started, I think, seven years ago or six years ago that uh, there was a deadline for the Graham Foundation for applying for um, grants. Like in our case, we were interested in a book, but we didn't know exactly what that book was going to be. And um, so this is a project for like from a weekend. This is, I know, we just put together this in a weekend and we applied to the Graham Foundation and then we got the fellowship or the grant and then all of a sudden we were um, exposed to the uh, to the challenge of having to, I mean, in a way, um, achieve everything that we had proposed in the in the submittal. So that was a pretty challenging moment, and uh, but yeah, this was literally six years ago, and it's taken all this time until um, the book was finally published. This is our second book, the first one. Uh, called Patterns, uh, Patterns Embedded. It's more of a monograph. This one, um, and you will see later, and as also as Keith uh, mentioned it, I mean, it's neither theory, it's not, I mean, it's not a monograph. Uh, it's I know, somewhere, it's maybe a bit of everything or maybe a bit of, I know, like nothing at the end, but I, I know we're pretty excited about this. Uh, it took a lot of effort and um and i think it's i don't know, hopefully it's something that you will enjoy so basically i'm base i mean i'm basing the entire lecture on the book so uh hopefully then i don't know i guess uh, this will also promote some uh, curiosity to then i don't know, be able maybe to understand better like how how to contextualize like the entire body of work that um, that we have as an office, as an as, an, as a practice, um, as a means to like in a way um, uh, justify or or in a way uh, support like everything that we are proposing in the book. That ultimately it is a way to read our own work, but within a context that is actually much larger than what we are that what we do and um, the maybe I you know the projects and and the, just the architecture that is I know in a way like much more accessible to us. So um, so the lecture title refers exactly to the name of the book, uh, which is Mute Icons and Other Dichotomies of the Real in Architecture. And um, so let me sorry, let me pass the oops. So, um, I mean, as, as I was saying, this is a book that, um, I mean, it's part history, it's part theory, um, it's also, um, it's part um, atlas, and, but, I mean, most importantly of all, it is at its core, it's a book that, I mean, in a way could question or could interrogate images that are uh, historical, they're also contemporary, but more importantly, they're also speculative. So we concentrated on the um, dichotomic state of architectural practice, but uh, not I mean not just practice, but also discourse and but also contemporary culture at large. We analyzed images that existed, but also images that we proposed, and the idea was to develop a language and a sensibility for discovering both simultaneous but also contradictory and even 
uh, why not unexpected uh, readings of different images in architecture. Um, so today, as I mentioned before, I will walk you through some of the most important aspects of the book with the understanding that pretty much our recent body of work became the basis for the production of the book. So we are not, we are not historians or theorists. Uh, we are practitioners that um, have the absolute need in a way to contextualize the work in a framework that is much larger than the work itself. So the book is basically structured into five different sections, which are uh, concept and history, discipline, projects, and um, culture. And um, the first section um, argues that do you, and this is maybe, I mean, just, it's a, I mean, it's a, not necessarily a preconceived notion of, um, it, I don't know, things that will continue to happen in the future, but in a way, this is also, in a way, talking about, you know, things and a history that is, you know, very clear to all of us, unfortunately, that, you know, it's been in our realm, in our reality for, you know, maybe the last uh, 10 or 12 years, or tell, I mean, I would say 10 or 20 years, or, you know, maybe even, even a little longer, but um, where, I mean, all these, all these external and uh, like I would say mainly external processes, maybe like some internal ones, um, have promote a deep crisis in architecture, and um, and has placed architecture in in a position where it needs a cultural identity. I mean that's something that I firmly uh, believe. So. We all know that in the past two decades, the world has been shaped by events like 9-11 and, and the continued environmental effects of climate change, the financial collapse followed by um, another bubbly economy or social political movements, including, um, including Black Lives Matter, Brexit, MAGA, the ongoing refugee crisis, the, you know, the, the war, now in Ukraine, uh, the rise of populism worldwide, and I mean, unfortunately, it's a very long list to you know, keep mentioning them all. Um, so, in a way, with no doubt, um, everything is pointing to a challenge of the most creative and projective aspects of our field. So, there is an often, and I would say, um, maybe like a declared idea of the death of the icon, which also includes this very specific declaration from the Chinese prime minister some years ago, um, where he stated, uh, he said of, um, yeah, like, please, no more weird uh, buildings. And in a way, these are all naive responses to the impulse for an increased, um, for an increased social responsibility and the search for a common sense and common ground in both architecture as well as in culture. So as the contemporary role of the architectural icon came under rather deep um, scrutiny, it is culture um, or the, the, the way that culture um, needs to persist and um, it, in a way was begging for a fundamental question, which is what constitutes a relevant and a socially engaged icon uh, nowadays. So I'm not sure that we are able to answer this, but we certainly um, want to position an alternative. And I promise I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on history at all, but this is uh, really important to contextualize the, uh, where the concept of the book came from and where it went to. Um, if I, or if we were to move from culture to discipline of architecture, or architecture as a discipline, I would say that the question of image could be traced all the way back to Robert Venturi's dichotomy between the duck and the decorated shed. Um, also arguing about the icon, Charles Shanks advocated um, of the importance to uh, sublimate iconography through abstraction. So he suggested basically that this moves in a way um, away 
from literal iconography, let's say from Venturi Zak as a calculated ambiguity and as an icon with an enigmatic signifier. And according to him, to Shanks, uh, the experience of iconic buildings is as diverse as it is paradoxical and why not even contradictory at, at many times. So icons are architecture, quote, in the shape of something uncanny, fascinating, horribly, and uh, or horrible, lovely, quote. This is you know, from, from Jax. He even suggested that in order to be loved and also defended, the iconic needed to be hated and even feared at first, mentioning the uproar over the the construction of the Eiffel Tower in Paris at the turn of the century, which was completely despised at first, only to be revert, uh, reverted uh, later. So in a way, we are certainly um, not arguing uh, for the continuation of that notion, of the icon, which has, um, I mean, I think we, we all agree that it has run its course, but we are much more interested in a tradition of abstraction, and I shall say, uh, maybe beautiful. So, an example is seen, um, for example, in the uh, here in the Black Square by Vladimir uh, Malevich, which displaces the religious icon that is traditionally placed or positioned in a corner of a room and replaces it with an abstraction. But we're also interested in the real in an architecture that is also able to produce a very constructive tension between visibility and reticence and abstraction and realism and character and uh, context. Maybe within or, or um, along similar lines, Raymond Baham insisted that brutalist buildings should produce almost an affecting image that is defined as something which is which is visually uh, valuable and that affects emotions with pleasure, displeasure, or mainly um, or maybe pointedly and at almost um, admixture of the two. So, but in a way, limiting legibility and the and visual pleasure. The mute icon demands a much closer examination, and it is um, it is its resistance um, which conveys resilience, and its uh, introversion stimulates communication. So, balance between object and building. The mute icon is defined by a dialectic uh, legibility. Say, for example. Uh, strange silhouettes or strange um, or strong postures or constructive um, brutality and apparent autonomy from the surrounding ground and uh, context. Hello? Oh, there. So, so it has an attitude, so the, the, the mute icon has an attitude that is absolute and unstable, that you can also be anticipated and strange, and at the same time, um, he can manifest and, and also be withdrawn. So by being elusive and fleeting, then the mute icon, in a way, entice lasting attention by delivering persisting uh, irritation. So it's actually Timothy Hyde who discusses a notion of irritation and argues that, quote, the passive manner of irritation or any ugly feeling can only be overcome by a complete transformation of the situation from which that feeling emerges. In the absence of that transformation, irritation persists as a simultaneous pulling together and pushing apart of person and um, architecture, uh, quote. So on the other hand, uh, Viktor Slobowski in his essay, Art as Technique, argues that, quote again, art exists so that uh, one may recover the sensation of life. Uh, it exists to make one feel things, to make the stones be stony, quote. So in other words, um, to make, to make the stone stony is to actually carve away the inscription that is already imprinted on it 
and it is to turn signs in a way back into things and form into abstraction and building into um, objects. So throughout the book and um, in our own work, I mean uh, our work in patterns, uh, we claim that in order to make the stone be stony again, architecture must appear um, both strange and wonderful. So here we are with our uh, strange and, and hopefully uh, wonderful book. Um, I think more wonderful. I mean, I think very strange, very wonderful um, as well. So um, the second section of the book uh, is history. And which, by the way, I have to say this it wouldn't have been possible without um, our collaboration with uh, Constance uh, Bale. She's an assistant professor at um, WashU. So um, yeah, I mean, she was a, absolutely instrumental in the, the writing and the compilation of the whole um, historic or history uh, section. So this section intends to uh, construct a lineage of uh, mute iconicity in architecture by focusing on building um, on building some projects that over a very long and a very vast uh, period of time have transcended their type, they have transcended their form, their aesthetics, and in a way have become foster, chi foster children of architectural irritation, autonomy, and even uh, estrangement. So, all the antecedents in the book are organized chronologically and they are described by means of orthographic representations and they're rendered familiar, but also at the same time, they're rendered strange and they are in a way, um, they appeal almost to a new life while communicating clearly the paradoxical nature that they have as uh, mute uh, icon. So just to review maybe a, a quick uh, or a few quick examples of some of these historical precedents and um, what is, I mean, in a way, the dynamics of the book in the approach of each of them. This is the Quasal uh, Farid Thom, um, which we chose it as being completely fascinating in terms of how it resists a very easy definition. It's essentially a very solitary figure in the Arabian um, desert. It has a form or it has a form because it's very, it's impossible to uh, define it as a, with a particular um, yeah, nomination. So it has a form that falls between ground and building and it has a status that falls somewhere between found and authored. It is a composite of uh, many different ontological orders that are merged all together in one single mass. And while the clarity of the image places or, um, or places it in the realm of being iconic, it has a character that is absolutely deceptive and duplicious and uh, why not uh, withdraw? So ultimately, the thumb presents a dichotomy between nature and architecture, between the found object, which is a gigantic boulder, and the designed facade, which is an ornamented uh, frontispiece. In a different um, antecedent, uh, Boulet's choice of the sphere, in this case, is a deeply political one and suggests the, the potential of mute icons to subvert existing um, hierarchies. So I'm going to move rather quickly through some of these, um, but, uh, but basically these are all precedents or, or antecedents that ultimately don't require to um, attract or to engage, but instead they almost uh, need to deter and defend and be irritant. So that's what you are going to see as being actually a common factor in um, pretty much all of the antecedents that I'm showing today, but also the ones that you are going to find um, in the in the book. So, for example, in um, Hugh Ferry's um, case, I mean, this is an unquestionably 
iconic image in the history of architecture. So it's just, I mean, the way that the, the, the step back building, like how it's rendered that, that presents or showcases uh, its monumentality and, and just the image itself portrays it as an icon but it's also not expressive it, it is a very austere mass um, and is basically controlled by uh, legal parameters so i think this this idea of the lack of expression it's um, incredibly important in the reading or legibility of the mute icon not just in these historical precedents but i would say uh, within uh, our work as well so um, the Carola Banker, as, um, as another example, is, um, I mean, it's actually you know, designed to go completely unnoticed and intended to communicate uh, nothing. And it's completely devoid from uh, or of social functionality. It doesn't require to, um, yeah, to attract or engage. And, um, and it's really, I mean, it, it, it has an intended and focus austerity and in a way it tries to evade an outline and it's strangely alluring. So um, it's, it's almost that the simple constructive fact that these bunkers or bunkers, I mean, I'm always, people always tease me for how I pronounce that, but I mean, that's all I can do. But I mean, it's like just the, the, the the only um, or the pure fact that these bunkers do not have foundations, I, that emphasizes their autonomy and um, it literally separates the building from the terra firma and detaches the bunker from uh, much of architectural um, or architecture's uh, historical relationship to the ground in which foundations constitute the basis of construction. So this idea of autonomy is also so important in the definition of um, iconicity, because in a way it doesn't really need a context to be able to exist or uh, present itself. Another precedent um, that we analyzed uh, was the Med Breuer on Madison Avenue. And maybe let's stop here for a moment. I mean, this is a, a I, I'm trying to, with, with this particular precedent, I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more didactic, uh, especially for students and the way that um, you guys, I mean, you as students in general, um, go through design processes and mainly through um, analysis of precedents and how those, I mean, that analysis then can be productively translated into the your you know, new ideas and how you might move on with your own with your own project. So I guess by now um, it is understood that the primary framework that we use to choose and to group all these precedents is the rubric of mute iconicity and therefore most if not all of these antecedents share many qualities. So um, the, the diagrams and drawings and precedents that I'm gonna be moving through um, in the next few slides, um, I'm gonna focus mainly on, um, on particularly the images and the diagrams and um, yeah, and the drawings and somewhat disregarding their history and their specificity of the uh, of their descriptions as new icons as a way to uh, maybe make more clear like how like what was the rationale between um, looking at these precedents like producing a very thorough analysis through the ru the rubric of new iconicity and then producing a set of images and diagrams that are the fundamental or the most important aspect of um, the book. So, but by the way, um, all the building photographs that, or the few that I'm gonna be showing also in the next few slides, they're not part of the book at all. I'm just using them as a reference in case um, you don't know the the building in depth, and um, and a, particularly because. 
and this is maybe just a small um, a, a small note on a side and, and part of the, the backstage narrative of this project. Um, originally, we when we thought about the idea of the book, it was our intention just to gather image from all these precedents and use photography and use just the material that was available to us as a, the basis for the production of our own um, our own material or our own analysis and, and narrative. However, we realized at some point that um, without modeling them ourselves and without owning entirely the, um, the, the extents of from which this building or this object could exist in the canvas of what we wanted to do, we, we just needed to model them. So basically that became the, 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 the basis of the book where every single rendering and drawing was completely uh, made by our office. So it's been five or six years of uh, endless summers uh, working with uh, our employees and with students and interns in uh, remodeling every single precedent so then we could start to project them and and um, and compare them through the you know, through the lenses or through lenses that would apply in a very uniform way to all of them so we weren't interested in this case uh, we weren't interested in the in the uh, in complying maybe with the lenses of the architect that designed the building or the photographer that photographed the building, but we really wanted to develop a criteria for us from which we could evaluate these buildings through the you know, again the rubric of the the mute um, icon. So now uh, getting back to uh, the broader building um, this is a building that stands apart from its context uh, therefore all images and diagrams focus on the building mainly as an object yet some of them include the party wall with broader design actually as being as tall as the building to incorporate it into the mass so the building massing um, can be read as both a pile and, um, and a monolith. And this creates, in a way, a material duplicity. It's a, it's a building that looks rough from afar, but it's very refined um, when you look, up, um, look at it up close. And the ambition to express this through abstract, uh, abstract diagrams and rendered images all orthographic projections, uh, because this was also a very um, um, important decision that we made in the very beginning of um, the production of the book, which was that there wasn't going to be any perspectives. Everything needed to belong to the realm of orthographic projection, of course, uh, isometrics and oblique uh, drawings and, and axonometrics, but uh, the perspective was completely eliminated from this because we didn't want to bring the subjectivity that is in a way produced by how we look at things through perspective. So this was already placing each of the antecedents into the realm of a, of a fictional reality or a, or a real fiction however you want to you want to um, call it so so this is how we were able to engage in very dissimilar levels of uh, abstraction and realism as i said we were free from the subjective limitations of uh, per, uh, perspective and we incorporated instead material precision and the aesthetic sensibility of the of the real so furthermore in this case it allows for the reading of the monolith and the pile and the primitive and the hyper articulated something that i mean if we were to project this or to present this in a in a uh, perspectival projection, we will never be able to see these two very different moments and almost contradictory, contradictory and, and opposed moment, um, moments at once. And another example is the Church of St. George, uh, which is both unified with, but also autonomous from the ground. It has a very strong relationship with the ground, but it comes 
from the fact that it is carved out directly out of, a, of the rock in which it sits and has absolutely no discrete tectonic parts. So when you look at it from a pedestrian level, architecture becomes both ground and object. It is also monument, it is also space, it is also nature, and it's also um, artifice. Once again, the photographer, the photograph, uh, I'm sorry, it's just for your reference as a didactic tool, but again, uh, not part of the book by any means. However, it's really important and something that, for example, we couldn't or we, yeah, we could not capture in the way that we were presenting this material in the book is in this case, the, the scene of the pilgrims that are populating the ground uh, at the void's edge and in the excavated areas below, which are extremely profound. So I guess, I mean, this is, this is something that can be just captured like through the actual reality of the, of the site um, and the project through photography. Um, in this case, um, image and drawings must include immediate context as a datum of both ground, um, for both grounds, the ground that um, it has to do with the bottom of this cavity and then the actual uh, elevation of the, of the ground. So um, the, the elevation of bleak in a way portrays an otherwise impossible perception of this cruciform uh, form. The diagrams move from the relationship of the building to the ground, both in plan and in section, and all the way to its capacity to stand alone as an object. So this idea of going back and forth between the architectural or the building as being an architectural object that is completely detached from its context and the reading and the narrative that is produced as such, and then the one that can be produced once it's reimplanted into the context and how different uh, and, and opposed in some cases um, they are. So in this case, ultimately, the church's uh, autonomy is clear in that it is indeed is an object, it is completely separated from the sites of the excavation and therefore it's rendered without the context and with shadows that help emphasize the objectness of the building as if it's um, sitting in the middle of uh, nowhere. Um, and now I'm going to move a little bit quick here, like you know, the Bruges uh, concert hall and um, the almost like cartoonish extroverted uh, character. Um, and the very strange posture that it has that in a way cancels like any singular image of the project. It, it's, it actually presents itself as a very strong or in a very strong image. It's always suggesting something other, but uh, what that exactly is, is not clear, is not clear at all. So the, I, I would say that the major achievement of this project um, it, relies between multiple images. So I'll move a little bit quicker, uh, quicker, the Pilmic Ridge Church of St. Mary and um, the Death Star. So I guess, I mean, we, with this, and I'm, I'm gonna try to end this section soon so we can talk about the rest, but the, with this image, you can also see and, and in a way um, understand better uh, the big range of precedents um, that we work with. I mean, not just in terms of dates, but also in terms of uh, subject matter. So uh, from buildings to objects to you know, buildings that took place thousands of years ago to maybe much more contemporary um, examples. So um, the next um, the next section uh, discipline operates uh, almost as a conceptual bridge in the book from the historical antecedents and into our work. It's based on um, opposing opposing one precedent to one of our projects, and and we literally try to exploit 
the visual dialectics of diptychs to suggest and construct relations and exchanges. So through this, we could classify and identify notes and concepts that move above and beyond history, and it projects, in a way, possibilities for contemporary architecture to take rather uh, seriously. So these are 16 of them, um, which are organized according to categories, uh, laying out a series of architectural ideas and qualities and features and attributes that are present in both contemporary projects and historical uh, precedents. And for the most part, each of these notes imply an opposition or a dichotomy uh, recurrent, which is a recurrent argument that we use to formulate an architectural sensibility for the mute icon. So pragmatically, both projects of each diptych are rendered in black and white, unless there is maybe interior light that applied was applied maybe to enhance either fragmentation or continuity, but they have very, simil very similar um, oblique angles and projections, and of course they are as mirrored as possible. So depending on each category, we use different parts or chunks of each project to make the argument and ultimately to generate almost impossible conversations uh, between them. So again, I will move rather uh, quickly here, but always, um, I mean, the antecedent, or the, the precedent is on the left, and then our project from our office on the right. So um, in this case, we are portraying, I mean, like two aspects of these two projects that um, have to do with uh, indeterminacy and vagueness, or incongruity, adjacency and disparity, monolithicity, or cuts and uh, awards voids of secure characters, shade and shadow, and etc. etc. So I will need a five hour lecture to go through all of these. So it's easier if you guys um, just look at this through uh, through the book. Um, so finally, I mean, this, uh, the project section, which is the third section of the book, is an embedded atlas of our own work within the realm of our professional, uh, professional practice. So it's basically, um, like we're basically presenting both uh, built and unbuilt projects and we organize them by means of representational categories. Uh, diagrams, isometrics, plan obliques, physical models, photorealistic uh, perspectives and photomontages. And they're all featured um, individually as part of um, also diptychs, uh, which has been a recurrent um, aspect of, or, or format for the book, um, but also like through curated constellations. Um, and they're all somewhat attached to all the categories of the book as appendices uh, to ultimately investigate the problematic relationship between abstract representation and um, the real. So these are these are all projects from um, our office. Um, they, in this case, they are not necessarily um, they are not grouped by um, tectonic relationships or um, relationship, relationships that are more related to um, what constitutes maybe the similar aspects through the rubric of mute icons for two particular projects, but mainly by like the image that is being produced through the actual drawing or physical model or rendering or um, a particular projections that I mean, each of them in a way uh, present. And always presenting uh, renderings and analytical diagrams that explain mainly in this case, like the formal uh, development of each of these uh, projects. So the first appendix, so what you've seen right now, it was just I don't know, the whole ecology of these objects, but then um, that they operate mainly in comparison 
But now there, as I said, there are a few um, appendices which then showcase more particularly what these, you know, what these similarities or maybe dichotomies are. So the first one, um, the first appendix is hyperblix. I guess we all agree that orthographic projection is one of the most significant attributes of architecture as a discipline that actually portraits architecture as both a distorted abstraction and material reality and also um and and i would say that hyper obliques also intensify this historic medium and are the ultimate paradoxical means of architectural uh, representation so all these images uh, engage in the similar levels of abstraction and uh, realism and they're completely free from the subjective limitations of perspective as i mentioned before and they are they start to incorporate this material precision and the aesthetic sensibility of the real, even though, once again, like through the actual projection, it's impossible. I mean, they, they participate much more on the reality of the of the fictional because these projections are simply not possible in, you know, in, in real life. The second appendix is about um, uh, models, physical models, that um, we take them as material reductions of the real, and as such, they're also liberating and uh, powerful. So this is, in a way, the inherent paradox of the architectural object, that it cannot be reduced only to its material constituency, nor it can be completely detached uh, from it either. So all these photos are combinations of physical and digital objects where there is a transferring or transferring of material from physical to digital and then back again to material and back again into physical. And in a way it promotes this feedback loop that is not clear exactly uh, where it ends and um, where it starts. And finally, the photorealistic uh, renderings appendix um, has the capacity to create narratives and to tell stories. So as you can see, each of the sections is actually quite independent in its own narrative in regards to image and image making, even though we are pretty much working with the same projects in all different um, sections. Uh, many of these renderings were inspired by the photography of artists uh, such as uh, Gregory Crutzen, um, Todd Hido, and Thomas Rod, but they're not just about the description of a particular project, but instead they intend to conceive parallel narratives in relationship to the buildings. We were also very interested in situating projects within their social, their cultural and political um, and environmental uh, context. And for example, the case of a museum in Budapest, uh, which is portrayed in a late winter night. There is a blizzard, the museum is closed. Of course, our project is the one on the left. Uh, I'm sorry, on the right. Um, so it is. I mean, it's strangely contextual, and the, the, the museum appears almost as a dark ghost. You almost don't see the museum at all. It is really about everything else. The museum just operates within the background. It's almost um, as the mass is hidden in absolute plain sight. It has a silhouette that um, outlines an, abs an, an, an obscure and withdrawn uh, char a character. So it's nearly empty boulevard in Budapest and it confronts a consolidated block of Art Nouveau reminiscent um, a, of another or a series of other neoclassical buildings along the, the city uh, park. 
So um, once again, I mean, it's really about the atmosphere, it's about the context, it's about the narrative, it's not about the description of the building per se. Another museum, um, this one is in Argentina. It is also fall, it is twilight, it's a cloudy day, the museum is closed, uh, which by the way, I know why in all these images is that we always have, we always need the museums to be closed to be able to portray them in such a strange way. I'm wondering if when I know they're open, they have a completely different image, who knows? So um, as you can see, there is almost a, a decapitated tree in the corner and an unknown piece of clothing that hangs uh, weirdly from a nearby branch. And the bright and exaggerated emergency exit lights of the museum are on and they cast, um, they cast really strange effects against the white marble facade of the empty building. So this is really machining architecture after hours. It's a lonely context already strange that is altering the quietness of, of these magic moments almost uh, forever. Um, in this case, almost um, it's almost how the image talks about environmental effects of climate change. This is Glendale. It's a Glendale project in Los Angeles that we are about to start construction, but that's not the point here. Um, but it is the image portrays the project in a winter night. It's foggy, it's rainy. Yeah, it's a, there is a very low visibility and, and it's, it's a torrential rain, which is, as you know, it's not very real in Los Angeles, but it's, it's almost like LA looks like a scene coming from Dave Fincher's film uh, Seven, where, for example, the rain never uh, leads up. And maybe finally, um, the, the painterly aspects of the cultural geography of Bali, in this case, which is also one of the, the projects um, that focused, uh, is focused on the construction of uh, cultural um, identity. Uh, finally, the appendix on uh, photomontage or photomontages is uh, focused on the, the paradox between abstraction and uh, realism, which is the case of Obliquo, which is the name of this project, which actually aimed to experiment with the limits and the possibilities of the image and how it can be technologically captured via drones and its realism almost hyper um, encased. So I am um, I'm concluding the lecture with maybe a a non-happy image of a project um, that I'll, I'll get to maybe tell you another time. Um, these are three towers in Los Angeles, but there are no blue skies or surfers. Um, and, but it's an engaging and almost uh, irritant view of the robustness of uh, downtown Los Angeles. And this is just making the point that Muteness is not about being indifferent. Uh, muteness is a speculation of new forms of um, transforming and positioning an icon that is less assertive, but still forward looking and progressive. As an architect, and this is an absolute uh, personal statement, I cannot imagine just producing boredom through projects, but instead, actually looking at moments that are interesting, even if at the same time they imply a delay in comprehension or a delay in understanding or a delay in legibility by involving a social culture into, um, into architecture. So um, I guess this is it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Georgina. <clears throat> Maybe you could stop sharing and then we can see everyone and uh, entertain some questions. Uh, that was really wonderful. It was great. It's, I always love um, getting a tour through a book uh, by the author. And I really appreciate um, the weekend becoming seven years. Um, <laughs> I, I know how that goes. Um, 
a short thought experiment um, turning into uh, you know many 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 hours of of shared work. Um, yeah. But it's it's also exciting for me to see you know I I know y'all's work, um, but to actually see the thought process and the connections that you're making. Uh, and it seems if I'm not misinterpreting uh, what you just shared with us, that maybe making the book was also uh, finding connections that you maybe didn't consciously know were there, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. right? That the work existed in many cases, and then you found the precedent for work that you had already created. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, entirely the opposite of how I work. <laughs> <laughs> Find the stuff and then make something else out of it. Um, but I don't. I don't have a direct question. I'd like to open it to the floor. Um, you can either type a question in chat, or you can unmute yourself. We are a small, caring, open community. Does anyone have? Yeah, a I would love to see your faces. I mean, let, let's. Um... Yeah, let's go to gallery view, maybe, Sarah. For everyone, or I guess you can do it independently. I'm doing it independently. Well, so I, I will. Oh, someone's just appeared, turned off the, on their camera. Um, well, maybe a question. So to to that point, Georgina, of <clears throat> identifying unknown precedents to your work, could you maybe uh -huh. speak to that process as you were? Um, working on the book, uh, did you have your projects at hand and then were sort of, you know, oh, I remember this thing or somebody would suggest, uh, let's say the Ethiopian church or, you know, Breuer seems like one you probably knew yeah. right, was an influence. Yeah. Yeah. What are ones that were not conscious influence at the time of the work that were then discovered in the process of making the book? Well, I mean, many of them, I would say, because, uh, of course, I mean, a Breuer, the Breuer building or, um, I mean, like some of the, the Herzog and the Meron, I mean, many of the contemporary projects, by, by contemporary, I'm, I'm still talking about, I know, like a range of mm -hmm. maybe 80 years <laughs> or, or almost like 100 years. Um, that we, of course, I mean, we all knew as buildings, even the thumb and maybe, I you know, like the, the much more historical precedents, they've always been in our radar, like usually like just to, uh, they were being used as, as the focus of discussion to talk about things with students. So they were, I mean, they were never directly related to our work the like from the moment that you know we started getting really interested in the whole notion of monoliticity that i mean this is maybe like one of the 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 origins of the idea of this book that actually started um i mean it was in a way reviving the book that um that el curi and um machado wrote or like put together for the exhibition monoliticity um, in architecture, I mean, I think the book is maybe now like 30 years old or so, um, which we discovered and we could not believe like how that book wasn't as significant as, as we thought that it had to be. And actually we, we, we absorb it <laughs> like, you know, where, I know we, it was just part of everything that we were doing because we were just absolutely fascinated with their, their narrative and um, how that made us uh, understand and perceive architecture in a completely different way. So I have to say that that book or like when the, the origin of many of the precedents that then were um, selected for the book also started with the notion of monoliticity. So I think mm -hmm. that's a, I mean, that's a pretty common, I mean, I would say it's almost like a recurrent um, a aspect that is present in all of the precedents, which I, I mean, we could argue at some point that, I mean, maybe uh, the notion of mute iconicity doesn't have to be directly related to monoliticity. Right. I mean, it's a. Right. I, that's. I mean, that they're not necessarily hand to hand, even though they're very close together. 
But um, so, I mean, it was mainly it was mainly that. I mean, these precedents were they were in our radar. Of course, when then you start to look for some precedents, I mean, there are others that come, I mean, in your way. But from the moment that we decided to own them, to remodel them, that also became a parameter for the type of, I know, the type of precedence that uh, mm -hmm. we wanted, because in a way we were even more interested in precedents that didn't have any that they weren't published enough and that there weren't enough images and that we had to make up like a whole narrative just with maybe a plan and a section. So, so that was also part of the, that selection process. Well, and and somebody way... had to tell us, hey, stop looking for them, because otherwise, I know, there were so many more that we wanted to, to include. Well, that's both the sort of the joy and the pain of the work, right? In that you want to keep going, um, but you can't keep going or you know you shouldn't keep going. I think it's also interesting that you did draw each of them, um, which in a way is kind of inventing them again um, in the choices you make in modeling them and how you represent them. Um, so that I think is quite fascinating. Yeah. I hadn't thought about like, does mute iconicity require um, being monolithic? Does it require being blank? Because many of them are also blank. There was a moment in your lecture where you referred to the objects you make, which I sort of, which mm -hmm. caught my ear. Um, you didn't say buildings, right? You didn't say forms, uh, you said objects. Um, and there certainly is in the way that you modeled the precedents or antecedents, as you were calling them also, um, somehow remove them from the realm of buildings to a certain degree, which I think is fascinating. Um, uh, more like pure form to a degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw a lot of cameras come on, so maybe that suggests that there are questions with these faces we see. Does anyone have a question? No. I can go on with questions all night. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's just, hi, how are you doing, guys? Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily like a fully formed question per se, but I was listening to um, to a podcast last night about how um, like universities and academia in general are supposed to like provoke and sometimes even offend uh, people. And I was wondering, like, because you were uh, more specifically talking about the uh, digital representation and how like it it's fallen into this like um it's kind of like a cliche now and do i feel like sometimes it's 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 meant to like please like our target audience instead of like oh man maybe maybe cause a reaction to uh i'm not phrasing this correctly it was, it's a half half form thought but um perhaps provoke the imagination of of the of the target audience instead of just giving them what they expect um I don't know if that makes sense at all. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's it. I mean, I, is that a, is it a question or I mean, I, I find it as a really interesting comment. Yeah, I mean, just a comment you made. Um, which I mean, I guess I mean maybe just to not to answer the non question, but to maybe follow up with another comment. Um, there is a. Um, there could be or a either like a very particular audience that maybe this book it's, is targeted to or a um or a no audience or no audience at all i and and let me explain this um like the book it's i mean you have to you have to look at it you have to read it you, in order to understand it this is not a coffee table book Right, which uh, without, I mean, this is no criticism to anything. It's like, I think our next book, we're so tired of this one. Our next book is going to be a coffee table one. Beautiful images, you just sit in a sofa, go through the pages, and then you are the happiest person in the world. Here, you say, I know, you're scratching your head like, I know, a, a few times while you're going through it. And um, so, but in a way, I mean, it was, I, th I think it, it, it reflects the actual I know, kind of uh, questions and challenges that we faced when we started to put it together, which is 
how can you achieve, how can you have conversations or impossible conversations between things that you will never be able to relate any other way. So that's why, I mean, it takes some time to also get into it. And, um, and in fact, I mean, it, it's interesting when I was putting together the, the lecture, I, um, so I wanted to make it just about the book, but then at some, at some point I thought, well, but I would really like to include some of the recent work. And then I was having a hard time how to start to talk about, I mean, how I cannot go back because of course the book presents the work that we did until maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago, because there is a moment where you just cannot include new stuff. So I was really, I know, I'm really keen on showing the, what we've been doing in the last few years, but then it was, I was having a really hard time, like, like just even aesthetically how to put together the, like, I know, like how, how to talk about the material that I was showing you in the book. And for example, an animation that we had to present two days ago for the city of West Hollywood for a competition. And then, which is, I mean, we love it, but it cannot be more op like opposite than, than the book. So then I decided, okay, let's just keep it in the book. That's a challenge. I mean, I'd be happy to show you the press, the, the animation now, and then just like, I be, like hear what you all have to say. But I think that's it. I know that, that's part that that kind of conundrum is also part of the um, like to to us. It's like I know what is really uh, valuable in the work that we do. That is, I know our own inquiries, our own issues within the discipline are the ones that we take and we use in order to advance our our work and hopefully it's well they, they 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 are to be well understood by by other audiences well, well that i think and jeff has a question but just related to that georgina um i think that's really what distinguishes and it may be a motivation for why we still make books um that it actually produces an environment in which we like construct arguments I mean, I find it so much more interesting than a coffee table yeah. book, although I wish you well on the next one, or the kind of straight monograph, right, which is a representation, <laughs> you know, in the, wor in the worst case, a monograph is a kind of representation of things already known and understood, and maybe they find new audiences, which would be the, the best part of that kind of uh, simple monographic presentation of the book. But I think what you did with this is you actually built the kind of theory of practice for yourself, I don't, it doesn't seem to me that it's a, it's an all inclusive theory of your practice, right? But it, it mined and, and gave you the kind of uh, lens through which you could do a little um, self analysis. Yeah. Right? Um, and what I think is so useful for, for student audiences, um, and frankly, all audiences in architecture with a book like yours is that it actually shows how one constructs an argument and that arguments are are not constructed a priori and then work follows out of them, right? Arguments are constructed as work develops. Um, arguments are constructed as we look back at work, as we situate work, as you said, some of the projects and precedents were found through your teaching, right? As your you know, uh -huh. theory develops in teaching too, which is yeah. I think why those of us that teach teach because that's really a vital part of what we do. Anyways. A long-winded comment, um, Jeff, and then Matt. Oh, yes, thank you so much for a, a beautiful book and the drawings and analysis. And my questions are: Are these icons like a references as a kid of parts that could be constantly reinterpreted? You know, because you've kind of reduced them down to these essences and constantly be reinterpreted, like massing and porous conditions, etc. And then the other question is. Are these, these icons are looked at from kind of like an external object, um, external perspective. And what about like the slicing of these and kind of the other kind of um, looking at these objects in other ways? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for, yeah, for um, the questions. And um, so if I'm understanding correctly, they, um, I guess, I mean, the, or the kit of parts that you are referring to, um, I don't necessarily, um, 
I don't necessarily see it as, I mean, as something that, I know, that, uh, that depends or have any kind of dependency one from the other. So I, I see them as being completely independent and therefore, um, like it's almost that I know, the narrative that we make about them is also pre-subjective to what we think about them, but then I know, maybe that narrative for somebody else may entirely dissolve, and then that element is not part of that kid, <laughs> kid anymore, right? So, um, so that's, I mean, is that, I, maybe I misunderstood the question about the kid of parts. Well, for instance, like the church and, um, um, Oh gosh, the one that's underground, um, Ethiopia. Yeah, the Ethiopian. Yeah. You know, that kind of precedent is, is this submerged condition that's carved out of stone. You know, that kind of condition could be combined with another um, kind of condition um, as kind of like this kid apart of looking at these different kind of um, different attributes as an example. But obviously they're all so, but, kind of yeah. unique. So, yeah. Sorry, no, no, go ahead. I mean, they're all very unique icons, but there are attributes that could be looked at as kind of like a kid apart. So like, I think the Ethiopian church of it being completely submerged on the ground, which is one kind of amazing experience. Um, and then if you had the invert condition of that, um, you know, a project that's kind of like the invert of that, you can kind of see that as like a, a, a kid of parts analysis, you know? I mean, it could be an evolving ex exploration of these icons. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that's, uh, that's right. Um, I think they, and maybe this could be tied back to uh, what um, Keith, what we were discussing a minute ago uh, about the, um, I mean, if, if these buildings need to also be somewhat monolithic in order to, um, I mean, like operate within this denomination of new icons. And, and, and I think, I know, the, the kit of parts might come at the moment of understanding that, I know, architecture is actually made out of parts. There is no way that, I know, architecture can be produce as a as a as a continuous solid and maybe that's one of the interesting aspects of like work uh, or choosing in this case uh, the Eth ethiopian uh, church because it's really made out of just one part right and um so and then the second well the second question can you remind me the second question please You're muted. Yes, Jeff, yes, yes. Um, oh, so um, <laughs> it kind of looked as objects, but yeah. the kind of sectional, for instance, the sectional conditions of the same church, you know, like um, you're just looking from the outside looking in. I'm just wondering if that would be any other. Yeah. No, that's it. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, I mean, the diagrams uh, present sections but they're very abstract so in a way they're just like always like trying to delineate um a, an outline rather than expose an interior and that's something i mean that you i think you you got into a, a, a kind of a very interesting point which is why there are no interiors here like everything has been completely limited to the description of architecture from the outside, from a mass condition, but a, a mass condition of the ex, of the outside, because we could argue that we there could be one of the inside as well, and um, and that's I know we are scratching our heads with that, meaning that I mean that could have been a decision like an, um, to involve that. Um, in the moment that we started to think about this, it was, I mean, we were just, I mean, it was much more about the building as an object in relationship to the context. So it's almost like, I know, I don't know if we were maybe scared to get into a new variable in the equation to start to involve interiors in there, but that's why 
you there are not many sectional renderings in the book and the sections are just very small very diagrammatic very abstract just to to emphasize the, the outer mass so um yeah you were right on with Nah, what's your question? Hi, Georgina. Hi, Hi Matt. Nice to see you. Such a long well. time. How are yeah. you? I'm doing so well. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for a great lecture. And um, I had a, a couple of observations and um, just thinking about how the work has developed since you began your practice. And um, something that was really interesting about the lecture was when you were talking about this idea of autonomy of the building onto a context it was still sort of cited on a podium potentially but it had a, a degree of independence from the ground and um, i think there's always some um, element of that in any project where um, you're dealing with a building on a site and um, I just wanted to sort of think about that connecting it to some of your earlier work and even your more current work where you've always been thinking about systems um, and their connection or expression in the skin of a building and potentially even extending into the landscape. And that also sort of led into the last section uh, of the lecture when you were talking about context and the narrative uh, and the expression of the building. So um, how do you frame it as a rendering so that the building feels muted and, and sort of acts as an extension of the context? And I think in some of the projects, there was an expression of, uh, let's say, the systems or the patterning that extended from the building into the ground plane. And that was an element of your process, I think, that was, it's evident in, in a lot of your work, but maybe more so um, in the first uh, book, potentially in patterns embedded mm -hmm. in some of your earlier projects. And I'm curious to hear um, how you've thought about context and sort of continuity um moving forward um in the particular relationship to projects or yeah um i guess just how the building is situated and how um and maybe it ties into this con the the question about interiority too but um, the extension of the experience from the outside of the project to the site, to the building, to the interior. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, we, um, there is no project without context. I mean, that's a, like context is also one of the, you know, the entry points to the project at, at all times. The fact that, we are disassociating some of these precedents from the context. Um, I mean, it's just to make it more, like to, to add legibility to an argument that we are making. But um, I guess I know one, one interesting exercise, and I'm, I'm also, I'm still talking about the book, would be to say, well, what happens when I put back my buildings into their context and I render them the same way that I render them we, without the context in the book, would I be able to still relate it to that antecedent or that precedent, right? And I think we can. I mean, I think that that, that relationship still exists, but um, I think I know, by removing or eliminating that idea of context, I think it's just, it's just it makes it more clear to emphasize the argument. Um, but then context, and, and I guess, I mean, this is maybe the part that I, I, um, I maybe regret for not showing, I know, like particularly the work that we've been um, working on for, or the, the process we've been working on in the last few years. Um, we've been, um, we, we are working in many different places, not that everything is getting built, unfortunately, but then we can claim that I know we have projects all over the world, but still I know there is it's going to take some time until they they get built. But then like context has become and, and I'm talking about not just I know, a, a geographical context, but I know culture, traditions, vernacular. So this is not just about the I know, 
the Sunset Strip as the context of the animation that I was going to show you. Um, it, but this is also about, I mean, taking it all the way to, to I don't know, building or like doing a project in, in Bali or in Indonesia or, or in places where, I mean, like context is everything. And um, so the fact that we have developed a pre-global practice or that I don't know, we are somewhat embedded in that right now has also made us look at context in a completely different way, where it's not just about the understanding of the adjacent matter that, I know, like that is, uh, or adjacent to the site that you are working on, uh, but also, I mean, how that moves all the way through uh, manufacturing um, systems and, and, and building systems and, and codes and regulations and, and styles. So, um, so that's a, we're, we're still pretty much embedded within, within that. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Gerard? You should unmute. All right, th thanks. Um, uh, I guess maybe it's a, a basic question of when you're, when you're making the book, do you have a definition of icon and a definition of muted that you layer on top of that. Um, so they seem like big uh, concepts, and I wonder if they could be distilled. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you're, you're, it's a simple question with a very complex. I mean, <laughs> it's not a simple question. It's a very complex one. So um, yeah, and I guess I mean maybe the a little bit of the the introduction that I I made um, about the book. Uh, at least, I mean, helps to portray a bit, like, you know, where this is coming from. And in the sense, I mean, it has a lot to do with, you know, with, it's a generation, I mean, it's like, we are at the moment in, in, in history where, I mean, we believe, and I, and I think a lot of other people might agree as well, I mean, the, like, expression and abundance and, and, I know, the, the type of, um, a posture that architecture used to have is maybe it's not appropriate anymore and um so it's like i mean i would wonder like what you know could another walt disney hall uh, uh, walt disney hall be built right now i mean or, well maybe that's not the best example because this is also we're talking about gary and then so maybe it's not about the iconicity of the building but then we're also talking about an iconic figure so that might, I know, may, that might not be the most appropriate one, but, but then I mean, it's a, it's really a moment where um, I know when we talk about the icon, it's like like for example, we architects or we people, we don't we don't make architects. Culture makes uh, 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 icons. Uh, uh, society makes icons i mean we don't decide i mean i can build the walt disney concert hall but then i'm not the one that is gonna say that is <laughs> hey <laughs> I, I i did this i mean it's really so it's it's the the definition of or or the the yeah the definition of iconicity comes from i mean a much larger um context and, and framework so yeah okay so, so that's why i think it's so related to the status of architecture right now which is also very related to the status of the world and uh, and the fact that i mean there like there has to be like i know things cannot be as expressive and as like egocentric as as they used to be and and in a way i mean they have much more to do with i mean like with what that element and maybe i know keith my i know maybe i know they, they tell me again well you're not talking about buildings it's like now you're talking again about an object or an element or a, um but it's like i know when when this building then begins to change the way that people think and the way that people move and i mean it really has an influence in that environment which 
begins to promote the idea of iconicity, but then that, that takes time. That's I know that's part of a of a long uh, process. So I think they like I know by any means like comparing our projects to projects that we think are iconic. We are trying to imply that our projects are iconic by any means. I mean, but at all. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that, I mean, it's really the idea of recognizing attributes of this iconicity and the idea of, I mean, this iconicity, like, started to be more blank and, and, and muted. Uh, yeah, okay. And um, so, yeah, I guess that's yeah. make sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense, yeah. Uh, yeah, to think of mute as a verb uh, really brings it together for me. So I appreciate that you yeah. taking the time on it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Georgina, this was really great. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and for sharing the book. Yeah. Um, look forward to an opportunity to have you up here in San Francisco um, for some other purpose. I would, I would love to. Yeah. We can do a workshop or something. I keep. Um, like looking for reasons to bring people here and have you spend some time with our community. I think it would be really great um, to continue this conversation in that context. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, Georgina, we will be putting this uh, up on our website. So the video will be available. Okay, um, that and sounds great. And thank you again, Keith. Thanks, thanks everybody for the invitation. It's always, I always feel at home with you guys. So this is, it's That's great. great. We'd love to hear that. Okay. Good night, okay. everyone. So good to see you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.